Hey. Um, have you ever started a, like a diet or like a health kick or a fitness program or something like that only to like give it up like a couple of weeks later? I've had a few moments like this where I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to get buff. <laughs> and so I'd like start... Uh, doing push-ups and sit-ups and lifting weights and going on runs and after a couple of weeks I was like, man, I just do not care enough to keep doing this. <laughs> and so I would stop. And then a year later I'd be like, you know what, this time I think I actually could get buff. And I would try again and I'd do you know, push-ups and sit-ups and weights and running and then go, no, nope, I was right the first time, I do not care enough <laughs> to keep going. Um, a couple of years after Fee and I got married, we bought a cross trainer, which is one of those big machines that moves your arms and legs at the same time, and it's really good for exercise. You could probably just do that anyway and save the money. But we, um, we thought about getting one, and we spoke to a few friends, and they're like, oh, no, nah, seriously, we bought a cross trainer or a treadmill or a home gym or whatever, and like, it just, you just end up leaving it there, and it just collects dust. Like it's, you'll just waste your money. And we were like as if you would buy something and then not use it. So we're like, we'll just get one. We'll, we'll just use it all the time. And so we bought one, a flat pack, and I put it together. It was not easy. And finally got it there. And we even set it up at the back of the lounge room so we could watch TV while we, <laughs> while we exercise, right? So at least we're entertained. Um, and that lasted for maybe six months. And then, and then it sat there, this giant bulky machine at the back of our lounge room just to hang stuff on. And, and then finally we just sold it and got rid of it. But I'm sure there are many other stories in this room of similar experiences, of starting something and then going, you know what? No, I don't care enough. And then just finishing. Um, often people give up on these sorts of things because A, they lose sight of the end goal or B, uh, they decide it's just too hard and so they give up. In Matthew 7, 13 to 14, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. I think sometimes we forget that life with Jesus isn't actually supposed to be that easy. It's not actually supposed to be nice and cruisy and simple. And this is where we find the audience of Hebrews as we start looking through the book of Hebrews in this sermon series. Um, the audience that is being written to is probably a community of Christian Jews. And they're in a spot where they are discouraged they're tempted to give, give up like meeting together and they're kind of wondering whether Jesus is kind of as good as they once thought he was. And that's probably a similar situation that a lot of us can find ourselves in um, today. So our passage tonight is chapter 1 of Hebrews and the first four verses of chapter 2. And at the start of chapter 2 it says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what you have heard, so that we do not drift away. Now, if you ever see a therefore in the Bible, it's a really good idea to look back a bit and figure out what it's there for. Okay? So, yeah, remember that. Because um, quite often, preceding a therefore is some evidence that backs up whatever claim or statement is after the therefore. Right? So if I said to you, Hawthorne are the greatest footy club this season... There's no real evidence for that, except if I said Hawthorne won the grand final this year, therefore they are the best footy club this season. And that's a statement you could probably go, yeah, okay. Like, even if you don't like Hawthorne, you can't deny that if they win the grand final, yes, they're probably the best um, footy club this season. Um, cars travelling above the speed limit have a greater chance of causing an accident. Therefore, don't go above the speed limit. Um... <laughs> There have been more Americans killed by guns this year than the total amount of Americans killed in terrorist attacks overall. Therefore, introduce some 
some gun control laws. Eggs go great with salt. Therefore, don't forget the salt when you're making an egg on toast. Okay, there's plenty of, plenty of things I could go on with. But if there's evidence before a therefore, it normally adds weight or meaning to the statement after the therefore. So, when it says in chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. So what do we need to pay attention to so that we don't drift away? So we'll go back to chapter 1, okay? Um, the book of Hebrews is not like other books in the New Testament. Um, it's not a letter. It's not a I, Jeff, servant of the Lord, write to you, grace and peace to you, blah, blah, blah. I've heard about all the good things you've done. Um, it's, not, it's not a letter. It's just basically a bunch of sermons, and so over the coming weeks, as we look at the book of Hebrews, we're going to look at these bunch of sermons that are given, and we're going to look at what relevance they have to us now. So we're going to start chapter one, and we're going to look at how this guy, this writer of Hebrews, who we don't know, unfortunately, who it is, scholars guess, but they only guess. We don't have a 100% answer of who it is. So the writer of Hebrews is actually quite clever in the way that he writes this sermon to the audience. So he says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And that's a clever way to start because the Jewish audience he was writing to would have gone, yeah, yeah, that's true. God did speak through prophets to our ancestors through many various ways. Great. So he's got them on board. And then he jumps up a few notches and says, But in these last days, like as in now, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So he's just made a giant claim about who Jesus is and not being sure whether these guys that he's writing to, are they know that or whether they've forgotten that. So he's giving them a reminder slash re-education on who Jesus is. Okay, very big claims, but he hasn't, he's not done there. He goes on and says, after he had provided purification for sins. So after Jesus had fulfilled everything the Old Testament had been working towards, that whole time, after he was the culmination of all of that, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So he's making some very bold claims about who Jesus is. And what's clever about this little sermon is that this first chunk that we just read, verses 1 to 4, that's where he makes his big claims. Jesus is all this stuff. And then in the second chunk, verses 5 to 14, he backs it up with evidence from the Old Testament, assuming that his readers will know the Old Testament well and they'll be on board with the authority of the Old Testament. So we're going to very quickly walk through his four main points and how he backs it up, and then we'll see what that has anything to do with us. Um, so number one, Jesus is the royal heir. He said he is appointed heir of all things. And I'm not going to go into heaps of detail here, but basically in the next chunk where he backs it up, he references uh, Psalms, Samuel, Chronicles, and Deuteronomy, all passages that point towards Jesus being the Son of God the Father and the heir of the throne of justice, which is kind of linking in with what Fee said last week. Number two, Jesus, the facilitator of creation, when it said, through whom he also made the universe. So he again quotes Psalm 102 later on, which the readers would have really known well, uh, saying that in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. So he's reminding them or re-educating them that these passages they've known about for ages are actually referring to Jesus. So he's backing up these big claims that he's made at the start. Number three, Jesus' eternal nature. Talks about Jesus being the exact representation of God and sustains all things by his powerful word. Again, in the second chunk, backs it up with another psalm. And number four, that Jesus is at God's right hand. And again, backs it up with another psalm from the Old Testament in kind of a rhetorical way, saying, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make an enemy's footstool for your feet? The answer is no, he never said that. Um, But he he has this big comparison um, with Jesus and angels. 
And it can be easy to focus on that, but that's not really the main point of this whole passage. Scholars once again guess at why he's doing that. Maybe it's because there was some angel worship going on then, which was a real deal uh, back in those times, but it's just a guess. Maybe because they saw angels as kind of the next tier down from God the Father. So he's saying, well, if angels are the next one, Jesus is actually above them. And he goes even further and putting Jesus on on par with God. Regardless of the the angel bit, it's not the main purpose. Um, Basically what he's doing, you boil it all down, he's creating a big, grand, epic picture of who Jesus is. Being eternal, being the heir of all things, um, sustaining all things, sitting at Jesus at God's right hand. Um, it's really the, the picture of a king. It's interesting that as he writes to an audience who are discouraged and kind of tempted to give it all up, he doesn't give them much to do about it. He just points towards what is really important. And that is that they have a, a correct picture of who Jesus is that Jesus is the king in complete authority. And if the writer of Hebrews thinks that's a really important thing for them to know back then, it's probably worth us having a good idea about that now. So we're just going to expand a bit on that idea of Jesus as king. Um, So king being someone who holds supreme authority over a nation or a city. Luke 1, 32, 33 says, "He'll He'll be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, Jesus is king. He's king now and someday he will be very, very clearly and well known as king. So either we can wait till then and be crazy surprised when he arrives and we realise he is king or... We get on board with that now and start to live in such a way that he is king in our lives right now. Not just because it would be better for us later on, but because that's what he deserves. I mean, being the purification for all sins, Jesus deserves our allegiance. Remember, this is not a king who demands that we earn a spot in his kingdom. He's the one that did the earning for us, which is pretty amazing. So in the Old Testament, um, God is referred to, God the Father is referred to as the great king of Israel. So Israel had the great king who was God, but they also had heaps of earthly kings. They wanted to be like everyone else who had earthly kings. So they asked God and God said, all right, let's do that. Let's put that in. So they had earthly kings, heaps of them. Some great, some horrible, some okay. Um, But what they ended up with was this duality of sovereignty. So the nation of Israel was underneath a earthly king, but also ultimately underneath God as great king. So when Jesus arrives on earth, God in, as man, the human and divine kingship is actually combined into one person. So that whole duality of sovereignty thing is eliminated because Jesus is both. He is both the earthly king and the heavenly king. And quite often you read the Bible and you'll hear this phrase, King of Kings. There's also a great song about it that we often sing in Sunday school. Um, And we hear it a lot, right? This phrase, King of Kings. So this phrase actually originates first in Ezra, Ezekiel and Daniel in the Old Testament. And it's not referring to Jesus. It's referring to either King Artaxerxes or King Nebuchadnezzar. And... These kings use that phrase, king of kings, to describe themselves because at one point or another, their respective nations were at the the pinnacle. They were the world dominant power, and that being either Persia or Babylon. So if you're the king of the greatest nation at the time, kind of in turn, you are the greatest king at the time. And so Jews would have known very well that that phrase, king of kings, referred to these great earthly kings that were at some point the top. They were atop the greatest nation of the world. That phrase, King of Kings, is used twice later on in the New Testament in Revelation, and now it's referring to Jesus. So people who are reading this book of Revelation and they hear the phrase, King of Kings, they would have known 
that that's only been just, that phrase is only used to describe these great earthly kings. Whether they were good or not, they were great in terms of their power and authority. But now, John, who's writing Revelation, uses it to describe Jesus. So in the Jewish people's minds, they would have thought, so this term that we're using to describe the greatest of earthly kings, we're now ascribing that to Jesus. You might have also heard that when you say king of kings, it says lord of lords. In the Bible, it does say that Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. Lord of lords is only used a couple of times in the Old Testament, and it only ever refers to God as the great king. So when you hear that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he is the greatest of earthly kings. That, is now, that belongs to him. But he is also God the great king, both in one person. Jesus is the king and will always be the king. And one day his kingdom will come and that will be amazing. Uh, when I was five, I learned how to play the piano. I saw my cousin Ash playing the piano one time and I thought, that is amazing, I'd love to do that. And so I asked if I could learn. And um, our grandma taught all nine grandkids how to play the piano. She was a very patient lady. (laughs) And um, so I learned the piano and probably enjoyed it for maybe three to six months. And then after that, I hated it. I hated it. It was, it was the bane of my existence. I really, really hated playing the piano and my parents and I had countless arguments about doing my piano practice. And I said many hurtful things. I often said, I hate piano and I hate you. And, and they would say, you'll thank us when you're older. I was like, no, I won't. But I did. And so I, I did piano begrudgingly until they said I could quit which was when I reached grade five in piano levels. So I got there and I did it and I said, that's it, fine, done, not doing it again. And I gave up for years and years and years. And thank God for Vanessa Carlton and A Thousand Miles because I would not (laughs) be playing the piano again if it wasn't for that song. (laughs) And luckily I'd played piano enough and hadn't left it for that long that I could kind of pick it up again and I, I got back into it and now I can play piano, which I love. But I would have really regretted it if I was standing here right now and I couldn't do it because I'd given it away. And I've spoken to a number of my cousins and they've said the exact same thing. They said, oh, I wish I could play piano as an adult. I'm so bummed I gave it up. I really should have stuck with it. And I'm sure you can think of your own story. Maybe it's learning to play something or being involved in some program. I don't know. We've all got a story where we look back and go, Why did I give up on that? I should have stuck it out. And so let's jump to Hebrews 2, right? We've done the big Hebrews 1. Jesus is king. Very big, epic, grand picture of who Jesus is. King of kings, Lord of lords, earthly king, God king, smack bang in the one person, right? And this is the evidence that comes before the therefore, right? So we're back to the therefore, In chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, right? What we have just heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Wouldn't it be the mother of all regrets if sometime in the future Jesus returns as king and we go, oh, that's right. I gave up on it all those years ago. Like, just imagine the deep feeling of regret to have that realisation when Jesus comes as king. And the writer of Hebrews is bringing this as an encouragement to the people. He's saying, so don't give up. Yes, 
Life is hard, and he's not trying to diminish that life gets hard, and sometimes life is sad, and it's frustrating, and sometimes following Jesus can be hard, whatever. He's not diminishing that, but he's saying, in spite of that, please don't give it up, because Jesus is king. That's the reality. Even though what you're experiencing right now might feel like the only reality, the reality is Jesus is king. Now, even though it may not feel like it, and and one day he will absolutely and very clearly be king. So please don't give up on him now. It's really interesting that the writer of Hebrews doesn't actually give them any help other than to point them to Jesus. We've all kind of, I'm hoping, seen a video or a poster or something about how scientists compare the Earth to, like, the galaxy and the rest of the universe. Can you picture it? Like, when there's often, like, a person standing somewhere and then they zoom out and then it's, like, the country they're in, you're like, man, that's a big country. And then they zoom out some more and you're like, whoa, that's a big world. And then they keep zooming out and they, like, compare Earth to, like, you know, Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and other... (laughs) It's not that funny. It is actually. Um, And other planets, and you start to think like, man, okay, maybe Earth isn't isn't that big. And then they zoom out some more, and then it's compared to the sun. You're like, flip, you know, Earth really isn't that big at all. But then they keep going, and they zoom out, and you realise, oh, man, our solar system is not the only one. There's like more, and then they zoom out some more, and then it's like the galaxy of the Milky Way, and you're like, I can't even see Earth anymore, and they keep going and going, and before you know it, that's not, the Milky Way is not the only galaxy, and they just keep zooming out, and we've lost Earth by now in the sun, and like, that's long gone, and they keep zooming out, zooming out, and before you know it, there's just this big black expanse with heaps of white dots, and the planet and country that we live on in is far gone. Like, it's It's so small. And Jesus is king of all of that. Can we just take a moment to stop and realise our position in relation to Jesus as king? And have you seen the Francis Chan uh, rope eternity illustration? You might not have. There's a guy called Francis Chan. and, uh, And he has this rope. And... I don't know if you can see that, but there's like a yellow bit of tape on the end. If you can't see it, it's about this big. Just a yellow bit of tape. And that represents your life or my life on earth, right? It's not huge. And then this, this is eternity, right? Look how much there is. It just keeps going. I mean, eventually this one will probably stop. But the real eternity rope will keep going. I mean, look, look how much there is. And so often we spend so much time and we put so much energy into this bit and we forget. Look how much there is. Like we forget about all of this. And Jesus is king of all of this. So if this is where life is heading, please don't give up on it. Like if this is where it's all going... In light of all that, don't give up. Even if life's tough or you've had enough of following Jesus, please remember that Jesus is king of all of this and all of that universe. And that's that's where it's all heading. And this is the encouragement that the writer of Hebrews brings. He doesn't give them anything to do. He just points them to what's, what's the most important. Okay, so even if you decided pretty soon you, you're going to, Pack it all in because it's too hard. Or even if you've been following Jesus for a while and you're just quite content being lukewarm and just cruising through kind of looking like a Christian, please don't give up or give it away. And this means like on a big scale but also daily because I think sometimes we can say, yeah, Jesus is king but maybe just not for the next couple of hours. Or, yeah, Jesus is Lord of my life. Maybe just not for this vacation. Maybe when I get back. Okay, let's not give up on Jesus big scale, but also like daily. Let's remember that he is king and let's choose him rather than the many things that we think are so important on this little spot. Let's not ignore such a great salvation. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you that 
regardless of what we think, that you are king. We thank you that you, as king, came and died for us and brought about the purification for our sins. And I thank you that you don't make us earn our spot in your kingdom, but you did the earning for us. Jesus, help us to choose you each day. And when life is hard, God, give us this image again of you as king so that we would not give it away and regret it one day later. We thank you for your love and that you are constantly here to help us, that you are here to help us grow, that you are here to constantly and consistently save us. Help us give up our lives for you as well. Amen.